Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Mike Haggerty. I'm alongside here with Mike Clayton, and we've got Nate Carr with us today. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun, uh, Nate, to get you on the show. We talked earlier about trying to get you on and finally ran you down. And I know you're a super busy guy, but uh, yes. man, I know a lot of coaches and people out there are going to be real interested to hear what you have to say in regards to coaching, uh, certainly coaching your own son in the past. A lot of things that come to mind. Your 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 past uh, career as an athlete, now as a coach, and and just you bring so much to the table. We're really excited to have you with us. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Mike, I'm going to let you kick it off. What's your first question for Nate today? What are you going to do for your birthday? You got a oh, birthday funny. coming up the day yeah, after we launched. You going to start with that? <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> no, I'm going to spend it with my uh, grandchildren, my two grandboys. We'll spend some time. I'm going to spend some time with them, and then I'm doing a, a camp at White Knoll, and uh, so looking forward to that in South Carolina. How many grandkids do you have now, Coach? Three. Three. <laughs> awesome. Two boys and a girl. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's great. All three wrestling. No, well, the, my son, their father's a great basketball player. Used to wrestle when he was wrestling. I think he just taken second in the states, and somebody challenged him to play basketball, and it was over. He left <laughs> wrestling, played basketball, and my goal was just to be a professional cheerleader. So I didn't care, you know, if he played basketball. So that's but so we. To say that they're great black basketball player players, they're ten and six. So, so with this birthday coming up, you're going to be just over. <clears throat> <laughs> How do you keep the motivation? You're with the RTCs and the training and the camps and the clinics and the kids and wrestling and there's so much going on in your life right now. What what is it that still drives you? Well, a couple of things. I think if I look over my life, if I were was to take a broad statement it would be Nate Carr is a professional encourager. And then a great definition of coach is in the book, Coach to Coach. And in there, it says a coach to, is a, take, he's to take someone somewhere they want to go when you can't get there by yourself. And so I'm just helping people uh, get to where they want to go, basically. And, you know, hopefully they realize they – need to help, they need some assistance, need some guidance, need some direction. And I could uh, kind of just be a professional cheerleader on the side to help them get there. And when I look back over my career, to have a good coach in the corner is unbelievable. You say Nate. professional cheerleader, but you didn't say professional dictator or professional yeller or professional intimidator. You use the word cheerleader. Yeah, a lot of times in coaching, we may go into those other kind of darker places. Um, why do you choose that word? Well, I, I think one of my maxims is that in the world today, negativity is on wholesale. Mm -hmm. So when I have a chance to be an influencer, then I'm really going to try to have a very positive atmosphere. And so every time I talk to an athlete, First, I'll try to make sure I lead in with a positive. And even when I have to make what I call a correction, I don't even like that word as much as I like adjustments. So I'll start with a positive, put a, an adjustment in the middle, and end with a positive that hopefully is interwoven with the goal of where the athlete is going. So like, for example, if you just lost to the top guy in the country, I'll start off with, you know, Mike, you had great elbow control. I love your fake pause and take. You know, I can't wait to meet with you Monday to make adjustments on that single leg because when we do that, I know on the way to your NCAA championship, you're going to be unstoppable. <clears throat> I love that. That's we, we do that in our coaching clinics at the silver level. We, we recommend a four to one ratio of yes. praise. And I like your word adjustment, right? We used to yeah. say praise to critique, but adjustments even better because critique still can be a negative feeling. Where adjustment, right. Yeah. Hey, Constructive little... criticism to me is 900 different ways to say something negative. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, that's awesome. I love that. Thank you. You're welcome. Nate, uh, let's back it up just a little bit. Hey, tell us a little bit about, hey, what got you into the sport of wrestling? You talk about all this encouragement that you bring. Was there somebody <laughs> in your background that was that person? What got you going? Well, I think the encouragement was, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank God for my godly parents, just unbelievable people. My dad, is he's passed on six years ago. And my mom is 93. Her mom died at 106. Uh, but, yeah, they were just good people. And the biggest thing that I got from my parents is that they love me. And then from that, there is a God in this world uh, that can always be there for you when you can. And uh, I think those are the two biggest things. And then uh, my brothers, my oldest brother started wrestling uh, and then he quit. His name is Wooly. He went to karate. He was second in the world in karate, stayed with that. Then Fletcher started to wrestle. Then everybody pretty much wrestled from there all the way down. And yeah, that's it. Pretty much I didn't have a choice. I didn't realize how good my brothers were. So pretty much the reason I say that I'm, I was a decent wrestler is because I got beat up all the time. <laughs> 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 I mean, those guys didn't give me a break. I mean, they would, I mean, I would cry like Jimmy, who was just a phenom, a prodigy. I was like, I was crying like, hey, I'm going to take you down. He's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, and I was just crying, trying to run him down. No, so he loved telling that story when he made me cry. You know, so, uh, but he's, he's since passed on. But, man, what a stunt. I just didn't know he was that tough. I'm like, give me a break. I never got any breaks. Going right? to practices and wrestling in national championships was a break to you. <laughs> 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 hey, how about I won the national championship as a sophomore, went back home. I think they, they, they had a wrestling practice in the YMCA. It's a good crowd there. And I'm wrestling my brother Jimmy. I hit him with a duck. I left my arm up too long, and he ducked that side and threw me. I knew he, I knew he was going to throw me. So I was trying to get to one of those poles wrapped with the mat. And as soon as I got there, he threw me in slow motion. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the welcome to the real world, Mr. Big Deal. <laughs> oh goodness. Well, well now here we are. Here here's we got Nate Carr here. Nate, talk to us a little bit about your competitive days uh and, and how has that served you well in your coaching? I mean, what what's it brought to who we see today as Nate Carr? Well, I think a lot of changes in my life before, around, you know, a lot of the changes in my life have come from books. So I think leaders are readers, readers are leaders. And, you know, number one, the Bible uh, was big for me. You know, with my dad being a preacher and my mom helping him work in the church. And so that, that was really big. And I, I just think the competitiveness came from the stories my brothers told me about competition. And, and then me just really, for lack of a better statement, trying to be the winningest wrestler in my family, which would put me at being one of the best, you know, in the world. And, you know, just wanting to, you know, be the best at what I was doing. I mean, I think everybody has that kind of desire in different fields of life or whatever it is they do. It's just trying to be the best. And that was my goal. And so... I read a lot, and I think reading is like cheating. If you can read about a champion, his downfalls, his mess-ups, man, it gets you prepped for what's coming in your life in that same sport. And so I read about how they competed, and so I always had like a, a strong mental toughness, especially after I grew. Because at, at 14, you know, when I'm teaching camp, I'll tell the story, at 14, I always say you got to have a strategy, no strategy, no victory. Here's the strategy of this situation. I'm 14. I'm wrestling a tough guy. And my strategy is to let him pin me as quick as I can, as quick as I could. And then from there, go to a girl's birthday party and have some cake and ice cream. <laughs> so I went out, let the guy pin me, 
when you make the cake and ice cream, I just didn't feel good afterwards. <laughs> but I did make some adjustments after that. So. But yeah, just the mental toughness, just, you know, speaking to yourself, talking to yourself. And, you know, like the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he, not so is he, so he thinketh. So it's a big point of what you're thinking. That's where you're going to go. And there's a statement that says what faith and fear have in common is they both have a future that has not happened yet. Wow. So if I'm standing here and the championship's there, the way I think here is going to affect me there. So if that's true, I need to make sure I have a lot of reps from here up. And that's the key. Not only must I have reps from here up, but a lot of coaches will only make adjustments from the neck down, never the neck up. And I've learned to make adjustments from the neck up. And that type of thinking really helped me. And then I think second, hard work works. Nate, what were some of those adjustments that you're, you're talking about it, from the neck up? What did you have to learn from young Nate to the point where you're wrestling in Big 12 championships, national championships. What what were what were the, these adjustments that you're referring to? Yeah, yeah. So, some of the things that come up in my life just through all the reading and studying other people is I had a yes to my national championship. So on the way to college, this is with no talking to nobody else but me, talking to myself. One of the goals was to graduate, get my degree, and number two, man, and just like I'm saying it, Man, if only I could win a national championship. None of my brothers have won national championships. Man, unbelievable if I could be number one in the nation. And uh, that, that's it. So when I went to college, I never let anything pull me away from those two things. I'm not going to miss class. I'm not going to miss practice. I remember actually when I showed up at Iowa State, I told Coach Nichols and Coach Les Anderson, I said, even if you guys don't show up for practice, I'll be there because I wanted to win a national championship before I showed up on this campus. And it was true. I mean, I was just that blunt, that honest. And I had a yes. And acrostically, yes to me means you expecting success. So when you have your yes, which was the championships and graduating, that was the direction I was always going in, anything that was going to help me win. And when you have a yes, it produces a no with conviction. And a no with conviction looks like this. Say one of my friends wanted to say, hey, let's go get high. Let's go drink. Well, because I had yes to the championships, it produced a verbal no to them that came with a heavy conviction of wanting to win. So here's what I realized. Acrostically, the no means nearing objective. Every time I say no to my friends going in the opposite direction, I was wise enough to know that was taking me toward my goal of being one of the best in the nations. And um, the adjustments, I, I lost as a freshman, but I got hurt, tore my hamstring. Uh, I was beating Roger Frizzell 5-1 and uh, ended up losing to him, got my hamstring torn. I lost to the eventual champion, Andy Ryan, that year as a freshman straight out of high school, 9-8, I believe. Or one or two points. And so I knew I was right in there. I got hurt. I was still trying to get some points for the team. And in an overtime match from a guy from Rutgers, who I think was their first All-American, I cross-faced him too hard. And so I lost because of the unnecessary roughness point. And I'll never forget it. I was walking out of the arena or limping out of the arena with Coach Nichols. It was just him and I. And I said, you know what, Coach? Next year... I'm going to win this. And he just said in his nonchalant way, I know. And we went out and ate dinner, came back, won the championship the next year. But I knew I had to make adjustments even without the coaches. Number one adjustment, get off the bottom. Go over the summer, let nobody ride me, work on getting out. And so I challenged guys to ride me. See if you could ride me. See if you could hold me down. And this is what I knew. If I could make the adjustment there and master the technique of getting off the bottom, my chances of being a national championship were going to be very high. 
Now that's me personally owning the adjustment. So I worked harder over the summer than I did almost during the season, which makes the season easier. So you gotta love the process. If you love doing what it takes to win, I know it's tough, but winning can be easier. I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. I, I know you're writing notes. So, <laughs> I, so, so you win the first one your sophomore year. Yes. And then you're looking for ways to get better. Is that a yes. reevaluation of your goals? Because you said you wanted to win a national title when you got to college. You did that as a sophomore. Would have been just as easy to say, well, maybe now I'll do some, some more yeses in other areas. Yes. Well, and, and – and Mike, what I did, and you know, again, just I think from reading, here's my adjustment. Was after celebrating, the next goal was to forget that I won mm -hmm. and to reignite that desire to win again. And so hard work worked. So I went back to work, um, making adjustments in any weak areas that anybody saw or you know, coaches said, hey, you need to do this better or whatever. I would work on that. But I tell you what, I was definitely good at writing down the nice things people said about me. So I used to teach people, hey, when somebody says something good about you, collect it, write it down, laminate it. I only say laminate it because of the gym bag. You know, everything, sweat, gear. So laminate it and keep it close to your heart, <clears throat> you know, figuratively keep it close to your heart. And so I really just started um, saying, man, I really want to win a national championship for the first time. Man, if only I could win a national championship. <laughs> man, I would love it. Oh, it would be unbelievable if I could win. And uh, I started all, over again and ran into a guy named Kenny Monday. Of course, uh, that changed it a little bit. <laughs> it, it went from, you know, trying to win that uh, second one to like, Kenny Monday is not beating me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Look, anybody else could win except him. I'm good with it. <laughs> hey, speaking of Kenny, we had Kenny on. He, he brought up the fact that if it wasn't for a Nate Carr, there would not be a Kenny Monday. And I mean, yeah, he, I he was sincere. That, yeah. yeah. And yeah. It wasn't there, a, was it your senior year that it was the big 12 championships at that time, the big, the big eight, right? The big eight. Yes. yes it was, yes. <clears throat> I think the, 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 uh, the championship fell with you and Monday and Roper from yes, down the road here. Yes. Wes was here. Was in there. Wes, I think we Wes all placed like zoo. four, top four. And, and Frizzell, it was you, Frizzell, Kenny, and, and Roper, and then went to the national championships, finished still top four, just different order. Yes, yeah. uh, the order changed. But uh, Kenny Monday, what a great competitor. And, you know, I have ultimate respect uh, for Kenny Monday. Can't say enough nice things about him. Uh, for sure, he is one of the guys in our sport that literally has won at every level. Mm -hmm. And I remember wrestling him the first time, and yeah, the, it, it might have been that great plane start or something, but I, I wrestled him. He's a freshman. I think I, I'm a sophomore. And I think I beat him 9-1 or something, something like that. And no, maybe no, my junior year, maybe. Yeah, my junior year, his sophomore year. And so I wrestled him. I beat him 9-1. He was like, next time we wrestle, I'm going to get you. I, I'm going to beat you. And I was thinking, like, uh, I had nine, you had one. <laughs> you know, but you know what? The next time we wrestled, he beat me. <laughs> Boy, and I don't know if he – like, we were wrestling at the Hilton, and I really – he was tough. I, I was injured just a little bit. I, you know, I was going to miss the match. But since it was Kenny, I, you know, I'm going to go ahead and suck it up and wrestle. But uh, he wrestled good, and he ended up beating me by two. I believe if it was another 15 seconds left, I would have won the match. But at the end of the match. Hey, wait a minute. He, yes. Kenny's calling me right now. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. He says that story, that's, not, that's not the way the story goes. Well, 
De- definitely there can be more than one opinion. So anyway, <laughs> so 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 basically, yeah, we were wrestling and during the match, he literally whispered in my ear, man, I'm kicking your ASS. <laughs> so I went crazy. I was like, ah. and, I, and I'll never forget the end of it was like, I was going for a takedown and Kenny was yelling at the ref. He didn't have that takedown. The ref was saying, <laughs> yes, yes, Kenny, he had the takedown. But you have the match, and Kenny was like, "That's right, boy." Oh, I was <laughs> mad. I got up, kicked him in the butt. Like, hey, we're just starting. But yeah, it was a fierce rivalry for sure. What What did you take? What do you take away to this day from those matchups with guys like Frizzell and Roper and Kenny and guys in your college career? What do you take to your athletes as a coach today that you can bring? Those were some special rivalries. Yeah, I. I I think to be ready, one, I'm always going to do that neck up training because it, it's, it's just it's just huge, right? Because if you change the way you think, you'll eventually change the way you feel. So I, I just think that's important. That's number one. And to be ready to give your best and then and only then weigh the results in peace. Now. The tough part is getting to that goal of where you're ready to give your all. When you give your all, and I'm coaching you, I like it because we can make the adjustments. I just need your mind, your body coming together, psychosomatic, mind and body coming together to reach a peak performance, and then we'll throw in the spiritual because I think that's just as important as well. But to have all of those ready to go. And so to go as hard as you can, and weigh the results in peace. Then from there, we're going to make the adjustments because you're going to fail forward. And I think champions and great entrepreneurs have this in common. They never personalize their failure. I so think you that's gotta well be able, Yeah, you, you got to be able to do that. I mean, I can't lose a match and say, you know, I'm going to change my last name. I'm going to break up with my girlfriend, uh, leave my parents, and move to New Mexico. And I got hit with 10 duck unders with my elbows like this. And the coach is going, no, all you got to do is bring your arms down. I'm like, nope, I'm breaking up with my girlfriend. I'm moving to New Mexico. I'm changing my last name, right? The coach goes, no, 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 just do this. <laughs> but if I personalize it, look what, look what happens. And so if you're going to grow – and if you're going to mature, you're going to le- have to learn that you could fail at doing something, as John Maxwell says, but it doesn't make you a failure. How do you, how, again, so many questions. How do you segue that for your children? I know, you know, Coach Haggerty talked about, you know, dad and being a coach. Um, how, how do you allow enough failure or create enough opportunity for failure how do you let your kids fail when you want to help them? You want life to maybe be easier or have more opportunities for your kids, yet sometimes it's really hard to allow them to fail without personalizing that on us as parents right. too. Um, how how right. do you do that? What are your reminders? Right. Well, I, I, I like this statement, and I think it fits it well. I was just uh, with Heath Esslinger, and he said something like this. you got to see in your children – is not as much about the outcome as what they become. And uh, I think that's really important. So pretty much, I just really stay with that philosophy philosophy of being a professional encourager. So again, I'm going to start off with something positive. I'm going to tell them how much I love them. And uh, yeah, that's it. And pretty much, you know, fail forward, or I used to, you know, when I was coaching high school, I would tell the guys, here's our slogan for the year, greater later. And greater later means that I'm going to keep getting better and I'm going to grow through the season and not go th- through the season. But I want to grow through. And if I can make the adjustments, my, uh, if I can make the adjustments, it's going to help me at the end. And I've got to realize 
the end is really what's it's the big deal. So at the end of the season, I might say something, no matter what your past may have been, your future is spotless. So from that point, I want to try to go undefeated. I know you beat me during the season, but that, that under is not working now. I know it worked then. So you you know, you gotta own that. Hopefully you have good coaches that are helping you go somewhere you want to go and you realize that you can't get there by yourself. Nate, what was one of your um what was one of your things that you felt like you had to work through that didn't come easy to you? What was something that you really had to focus on as an athlete and maybe even today as a coach that <clears throat> doesn't come easy to you that you have to to work a little harder on than you think most? Well, I think a great coach realizes that he has to share the areas that he had to grow through. <clears throat> For me, I think I could even be better if one, if I had a coach that was consistent in my life that would have a feel for me and I could trust him. You know, I, I think that's huge. I didn't always have that. I know when I went out in 84, I won the championship in 83. You know, my brother made it, the Olympic team, you know, 16 going on 17. I even wore his warm up to a, a tournament and I learned a lot there. The warm up alone got me to the finals. But, anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but but I, I think that, you know, expressing to other people what I've learned from the sport, and that is to grow through and to have somebody come alongside. And I think the the other thing would, would be that I realized how important the mental part is. And so when I didn't do well, I'm going to tell you, it's how I was thinking. I can't be honest enough. That, that's being straight up honest that if I had stinking thinking, it affected my performance. Hmm. And then I think, you know, a good coach will try to make things simple. So like freestyle. I mean, dude, don't even worry about it. Take people down, stay off your back. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but, but to make it simple, even the different rules, of course, what's frustrating in our sport is they change the rules so much. But anyways, you know, but to, to, to make it simple, you do this well, it, it's just right there. It goes over to this thing. Put the guy on his back, all of the sport, all the different styles, Put the guy on his back, they're going to give you points for it. And I think a good coach is realize that you got to have a foundation, but don't be in such a box that you cannot add creativity to the foundation. That creativity piece is really big because if I'm a coach and I'm going to bring creativity to practice, I kind of have to plan for creativity sometimes, don't I? Uh, I, I, I come on. <laughs> you see how those guys, how about every sport has a fate? How about I'm letting you get my leg only to pin you? I mean, come on. So so that's it. A basketball, I hold the ball with my right hand, but I'm actually going to pass it to the other guy with my left hand. I'm going to fake right, pass it left. I'm going to pretend I'm going to dunk it, then I'm going to pass it to the other guy next to me. Well, all that stuff's playing. So I really do a lot with fakes. And wrestling is feel. So I'm making you feel something in order to trap you here, right? I mean, that's that's the fun part of it. That's that growing. And the best guys do that. They make you feel one thing only to get you in another. Now, not only do we do fakes, but you must be three or four moves in advance. And so I'm doing one, two, three, only to go back to one and catch you. <laughs> right? I fake the right leg first, but I'm really, after the other movements, I'm actually coming back to the right leg. But it's all planned based on how you're going to wrestle me. So for every action, there's a reaction, you know? And so even a lot of my technique, that, that's what I try to do. You know, I know you only got two legs. <laughs> if one's back, I'm going to try to get the other one. If both, if both legs are back, I'm going to pull your head down. Of course, if the body is animated, the head's going to say, stop pulling on me. 
then it comes up, then I'm gonna attack again, right? Or I'm gonna try to get around you and you're gonna say, no, don't do that. Well, then I'm gonna take the leg that's coming toward me or I'm gonna fake the leg that's coming to me and take the other one. You know what I'm saying? Just that's fun, but a lot of it is um, really wrestling the body. And I'll say this, seven out of 10 guys are gonna do this when I get an inside time. Mm -hmm. You see that? So now I work with my partner and we drill what seven out of 10 will do. All right, quick question, Nate. Yes. Where, where did that cross step duck to the body, where did that come from? Oh, dude, my brothers. Them guys were showing me stuff. I was jumping on people. I mean, just all kind of crazy stuff. Now, what's funny is when they were teaching me, I was like, this is so crazy. But as my wrestling grew, my body was like, along with my mental awareness, was like, hey, I've been here before. Mm -hmm. And there's that creativity. They were stretching me, and it came back to help me. So my brothers were teaching me that, you know, duck left. If I duck under your arm, you know, you can move that leg. Mm -hmm. But your focus will only be on moving that leg. Well, it's the other leg I want. Right? And then once you watch the videos, you're like, oh, man, he's making me step back. Now I'm going to go for that leg and then come back this way and take a leg I you initially took back first. But I'm three steps. You see, it's like one, oh, two, three, back again. Hit on the shot. So, but yeah, I, I got a lot of that from them. And then I think speed kills. And it really helps if you're wrestling on Sunday, if you don't breathe until Monday. <laughs> well said. Well <laughs> said. You know Coach Clayton. <laughs> Coach Clayton is scratching his head going, what did I just hear? <laughs> so anyways, you say, I really, hard work works. And one of the things is, I, I mean, I, I work so hard. I always say that I pull like a Jedi mind trick, you know, and basically if I can work out an hour and a half straight with no problem, then go ride a bike for 90 minutes or whatever, lift weights, it's literally going to be impossible for me to get tired in seven minutes. So I could leave 13 pounds over, which is not good. I'm not saying to do that. Leave, leave going to the match 13 and a half pounds over, eating milk and chocolate chips, get to the get to the new the gym that we're gonna wrestle in of the opposing team, let you see me lose 13 and a half pounds, and I'm still just gonna kick your butt. <laughs> Message was I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get tired. I mean, this is what I do, right? So look how I did that. You know what I'm saying? It's like telling my son, hey, do you have those like is your stomach have that sick feeling? He's like, yeah. I was like, is, is your mouth dry? He's like, yeah. And I would say something like, man, that's incredible. That's awesome. That means you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> There's some Jedi work there. <laughs> yeah, so but anyways, uh, uh, it I sounds like make the, the last, you know, getting tired, the last thing I would ever have to worry about anyways. Yeah. It sounds like your expectations for yourself, your work ethic, all those things, your expectations are obviously higher than most normal humans. Do you ever struggle with lower expectations that your athletes might have coming in or maybe not understanding the length of how deep that, that drive has to go to reach those levels they say they want to reach? Right. So I would think that would be part of me, my helping them where they want to go. So as I come alongside, again, I always say the head is at the top because it controls everything underneath. So I really got to work on that part. And as I walk with them, um, it's not as much as making those physical skill adjustments as much as I'm getting them to make mental adjustments. And that's what I did at West Virginia University. I mean, we went six in the country. When I got there, they were 19. But I had to get them to believe. And so that was a big part of it. They came to me, some of them, not believing and with their head hunched down, shoulders droop. But give me a year. The shoulders are back. The chest is out. And they're looking at you. Good morning, coach. How's it going? You ready? Now, they didn't used to be that way. But now they're up for it. So 
you know, your biggest defeats will come not by your opponent as much as by yourself. And then enemy sometimes means enemy. <laughs> Yeah. Nate, here, here's something I, w I wanted to touch on real quick. Uh, give us some insight because <clears throat> coaching today provides different opportunities for different style of coaches, uh, meaning that we have coaches at the youth level. We've, we have coaches at the high school level. We have college coaches. We have RTC coaches. We have <laughs> national team coaches, right? And all of them play – and function maybe a bit differently. There's still the, the, you still have to have the ability to understand the sport, communicate the sport, work with yes. athletes, but there are different styles of coaching even within yeah. those regional training centers. Not everybody's approaching the training centers the same way. How do you see your role at, at, at maybe the, the regional training center? And then also what's your general thoughts about how successful coaches can fit into these different places, whether you're a youth coach or high school or. Uh, well, I tell you, you got to value, you know, you got to value the people. Uh, praise effort and reward performance. But I, I think that for sure, and don't miss this, is you, I mean, you got to love what you're doing and people are human. I mean, that's your son. That's your nephew you're coaching. So it comes a long ways. Like you really got to care for the athletes. And if I'm going to care for the athletes, I've got to realize that I've got to put them up. I've got to encourage them. I got to make the adjustments, you know, like, I can pat you on the back, that's good, but 12 inches down, you know, I might have to hit you there as well. But, you know, realizing that and, and the difference, but I think you, you got to really encourage them because otherwise athletes will grow up hating the coach. Look where that coach took them. They're going somewhere. And so I think one of the biggest things you can tell the guys is, you know what? I'm proud of you. Just think, if you're encouraged, man, I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, hopefully you're there and you want to work hard as well. But, yeah, I'm going to use the – I'm really going to try to value the person, you know? I'm gonna yeah, do, you to, see, do you see that as yeah. your biggest role as oh, uh, yeah. at the RTC? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. well, they have dreams, and that's the whole thing. If you're at the RTC level, you're already dreaming. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, I hope so, I mean, right? <laughs> so you're already dreaming, and then really, again, I'm coming alongside of where you're going. I'm going to help you get there, you know? And even at the RTC level, I'm just saying, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, everybody work hard. That mind but is maybe so important. They, maybe they just... Maybe they work harder physically and not here up. Because mm. if there's any trepidation, if there's any fear, oh, man, the acrostics for fear is falseness expressed as real. Right? And that's what's stopping you. It's not like this thought comes to your mind and you ask the thought seven questions. If you did that, it would go away. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> Mike and I talked about this prior, too. And, and, and there's certainly, we can't get past this uh, question. Coaching your, your, your own son uh, and, and working with David, this has been big for you, I know. I, I had the opportunity to coach my son through high school, and then he went on and, and wrestled collegiately as well and is now coaching. But <clears throat> it, is, it is different. But in yeah. our sport, it's not that unusual. Yeah. It's not that unusual. We see a lot of dad coaches. And and I've had the question asked to me, well, what was it like and how did you do it? For me, it, I, I saw a lot of good examples and I saw a lot of bad examples. Yeah. And I, I tried to – when I knew that my son was going to compete, was going to be a wrestler, um, I tried to recall those experiences and memories 
of the good and the bad. And I don't know what what's been your approach, Nate. Uh, well, <clears throat> first of all, like I already told you, I mean, my one son already went from basketball, from wrestling to basketball. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How could he do that without my encouragement? How could he do that without me wanting the best for him? So I'm going to try to be consistent in that area uh, with showing them that hard work works. And even if you're my son, my son's on my team. So what I'm telling them in the wrestling room, he's already got at the house. I mean, I'm the same person. I mean, I'm going to be real. So he knows, you know, hey, I want you to treat people right, you know. I'm trying to live right in front of you, you know, so I'm doing all of those things. <clears throat> now, when it came to coaching David, so I was coaching them, just really encouraging them. And no, none of my children had I forced them into wrestling. I used to let them just run around. So David just got interested on his own. I mean, he's riding a little unicycle, doing some other stuff, playing basketball, doing karate, whatever. And then he just, you know, he wanted to wrestle. So, I mean, my wife coached him at his first wrestling tournament. I don't think he was crazy about it, but she knows a lot of wrestling. So, <laughs> so, so but, but anyways, he just, that's how he started, I don't know, like fifth grade, whatever. But he just got serious and he saw me work with guys personally and saw them go to another level. And what he saw is I'm teaching them what to read because this is important to me. I know I got to get this right. The wrestling part is no problem. I got to get this ready. So I'm telling him what to read. And he just seen guys like we had, I was working in a garage with some guy. Almost everybody in there was in the state finals or won it or were topping in eight. I mean, I'm just pouring into him, you know, and he saw that. And, you know, just, I used to take him to tournaments and he would lose. This is when he was little, just starting out. <clears throat> and my wife would say, Man, that's a lot of money that for him to go there and lose. <laughs> but, 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 you know, and David would cry, you know, but I told my wife, I said, I'm aiming him. So I already knew, dude, hey, just fell forward. This is great. You're learning new stuff. It's coming. Trust me. You know, and yeah, so, but the mental part, even with David, I know he lost in seventh grade. I think his coach said something like, this guy's a three-time state champion. He's one of the best guys in the tournament. He's really tough. Go out there and get him. you got to be kidding. I didn't know that till later that the coach said something like that. David didn't wrestle till the second period, and he still almost came back on the guy. And so this is what I told my son coming off that match. If you listen to me, the guys that are beating you now won't touch you later. And it came to pass. But he definitely saw me reading, caring. When he was in high school, I let him go with my brothers for a year, and that was exciting. He ended up beating the, one of the top recruits in the country. And uh, and my brothers are excellent. Joe Carr, Joe Jr., them dudes, it's like they know they're wrestling. And I knew that. So he went there for a year, and uh, – when he came back, I knew the adjustments I would have to make, and and it went it went well. And when he came back, and he was wrestling for me in high school, I had like eight coaches at Perry at Maslin Perry. And the one thing I liked about having all those coaches is I studied their personalities, and I used their gifting. Right, I can't be everything. So this guy was good at this. This guy was good at this. So I actually designated one that would be David's coach. But I was going to coach the coach. And it worked well. And David loves the guy. They're like best friends today. But even when I was coaching high school, pretty much I had a rule that you can't really say anything negative in the room. Why? Because negativity in the world is in the was on wholesale. When you came in the room, I wanted my influence to take you to a different level. So I was always reading to the guys, you know, they were always growing, talking about how to treat each other, you know, how to wrestle your best, have to, how to have your best performance. And we did some incredible things, but yeah, I, I didn't like, 
And since it was me, it's just me, but there was no cursing. Well, that's only because I was in charge. I mean, it's just, you know, and it worked well, <laughs> you know, so. But I think that was it. I, you know, even when I talked to David, I had a positive. And what was good about David is he listened well. Hmm. So if I said to have your goals up on the wall, I would go to his room at like at the state going for his fourth state title. I was just going in his room to check check on him. He had Columbus is my favorite place. No kidding. Yeah. Columbus is my favorite place. He had Bible verses. He had greater later. Make sure you, a man really only fails if he's unable to cash in on the experience. So even if we lost, we're going to cash in on it. So he had all kinds of stuff up like that. Well, one thing for sure, David, David has fun. I mean, I've watched David, you know, kind of grow through the ranks and, and being around you at some of the camps and clinics we've had to work together, Nate, he's, he's always having fun. And, uh, you know, that's a tribute, I think, to a dad. I think it's a tribute to a coach that, uh, if, if their athlete or their son is in it at a collegiate level and having fun, that's what this is about. Yeah. 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 You, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you, they got to have a place where they can be encouraged. I, 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 I'm just telling you, they need a place. And so even if my kids are going through something tough, hopefully I've read enough books that I have a good story for every situation to encourage them. I, I, it's huge. I mean, and sure. that's what I do for my son. So I'm glad I'm here. Because he could come. I'm always going to tell him, listen, hey, we, we could do this. Like, uh, he won nationals. He said, we did it. Well, he's been hearing all these stories for a lifetime. I remember I told him I lost in the Olympics in 84. The trials didn't make the team. I was an alternate. And I tried to kill Andy Ryan. If I would have had a coach, all the coach had to say, hey, Nate, just relax. You won the first match. Just chill. No, man, I, I went psycho. One, I didn't have to weigh in anymore. I was like, I'm going to kill him. And it messed me up. So David's making this junior world team. I think he's wrestling Shane, the national champion from Stanford. And I was like, come on, let's get him. And David was like, I mean, he was winning by, you know, three or four points, you know. And I was like, come on, let's go get this guy. David was like, Dan, I can't even get a medal unless I make the team. <laughs> but he was alluding back to that story. He was like, chill out. I got the match one. You know what? I would say stuff to him like, you know, secure the win, then dominate. <laughs> you know, but uh, <laughs> but how about he said that? I knew exactly what he was saying. And you it's know, amazing so they pick up on that. Oh. I agree. Yeah, they pick up. They hear some of those verbal, nonverbal cues that if they're in our household as a as a um, if we're the dad coach, they're getting those messages. We don't have to beat them over the head with a stick to yeah. get it in there. Exactly. I think David said pretty much I had him hypnotized. That it was, you know, I had him ready. I remember going to the States and uh, and working with the, the assistant coach. And the assistant coach said something like, David, this is your story. You, no, you're the author. It's your story write your story before he went out there and david was so relaxed he was like man dad is that a nice suit you have on <laughs> <laughs> and he was wrestling <laughs> demons he was wrestling demons and they both were defending state champion <laughs> and i told him i said listen because demons pretty much goes up for party right i said david listen if he comes out in a four point stand four point stance or he's low <laughs> You have this match easy. And he came out in a four point stand. David just, yeah, but anyways. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, but, but notice that's communicating with the athlete. Uh, I'm, I'm making adjustments with the coach, and we're both coaching him. And so even at Iowa State, uh, Metcalf has a great personality. St. John has a great personality. Coach Dresser, you know, so you're just uh, working and navigating along with them. You know, what's for, in my case, what's best for my son. So, <laughs> Mike, wrap, but wrap I'm, us. Uh, I, yes. I go, I'm sorry, Nate. M- Mike, take us through. I, I, I'm sure you have some coaching questions regarding, uh, you know, what uh, the messages are here. But for our, our majority of viewers, Nate, probably a, a lot of coaches 
uh, connected with USA Wrestling. And, and Mike, what, what would some of your thoughts be closing this thing out? And, and what would they like to hear you think? Yeah. And, you know, I guess for me, how do you summarize all this up in the last couple of minutes? But the importance of the developmental pathway that you and so many of the, the wrestling members of your family, junior world champions, like dime a dozen in your family, like you guys went through the process to go to those elite age group level events at that high school and, and early, you know, not early, not youth, right? We're not talking eight right. and under world championships, but right. when the time was right, you guys were always there and always winning at that level. How important was having a pathway, uh, having these events kind of established that you're like, well, this is the next one I go to and I'm going to be the best there. It allows you to, to focus on your thing. How important were those processes? Yeah, it seems like dreaming would take care of that, Mike, right? I mean, yeah, looking around you, uh, reading the magazines, you know, and so even that really gets you to dream. For me, my brothers were so close in proximity. So, uh, you know, just looking at them and looking at others. Yeah, I think you just dream. I think the biggest takeaway is you got you, you to gotta encourage, you got to build up. I'm just telling you, because just think as a father, if you don't know your purpose, then this is a guy, this is a minister, he's passed on now, but named Dr. Miles Monroe, he pretty much talked about purpose a lot, and he said, where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. So if I don't even know the purpose of being a father, then I, it's a good, what about me just putting you down, telling you you're going to be a nobody? Do you think as a son, you're going to forget that? Are you kidding me? So you can see why coaches, their effect, the impact, the influence. Listen, sociologists say that an introvert in his lifetime will influence 10,000 people. So to me, what can I do if I'm intentional? It's just that I want to be on the positive side and not the negative side, right? I mean, I got to make, you know, I, I got to have a strategy. I want to tell my wife she's beautiful. She's awesome. I, I'm glad I have my seven children with you. I mean, just, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm making a time out. I've got to consistently pour in. It makes the environment better. I got to have positive things for my children, right? I, I'm just saying you get more out of that than, you know, <laughs> and, and not that there's not a time for it, but how about we agree that this is where you want to go and this needs to be done. So then I want to say we <clears throat> overestimate the event, but we underestimate the process. So I got to get my athletes to love the process, to love doing what it takes to win, to get there. Right? So overestimate the event, underestimate the process, but nothing successfully, no, nothing happens that's successful without a process. But we miss the process, you know, of treating people right, speaking into their lives. You know, who doesn't want to be encouraged? Somebody asked the owner of Chick-fil-A, who needs to be, well, or he said a rhetorical question, you know, who needs to be encouraged? Uh, women and men, who needs to be encouraged? And his response was, anybody that's breathing. Wow. So you're going to have an influence. Mm. Just is it going to be good or negative? But trust me, if an introvert's going to influence ten thousand people, oh yeah, you're going to you're going to be coaching somebody. <laughs> you're going to make an influence on somebody. Just how you act, how you treat them. So I think it's that's that's the real deal. If we focus too much on the outcome, we'll overlook things that will help them to become a better person, a good citizen. Thank you, know? you for your perspective. And I know that comes from the heart and that, I think that's why, sure. that's why you're so influential in what you do is because you have that belief and, and it's so pure in you, that belief of being just a good person and, and helping people out. So it's pretty yeah, that's that, isn't, isn't that, that's, to me, that's the real champion, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, you can be a champion in your chosen event, 
but it's more important to be a champion in life. Working with your son at camps, it was very clear that that is a value your family holds um, as as very important because you, I mean, you always see great wrestlers at these camps, but you don't always see the great people. And when they come together, it's just such a great, great it mixture is. for our sport. So I'm, I'm going to shut yeah. up. <laughs> I'll go well, all day. Thanks, Coach Clayton. Hey, we may, really have to, uh, we may have to have a part two Nate Carr. <laughs> we, might have, <laughs> we might have to. We, there's just too much Nate Carr to go around in an hour. Yes, so we might have to have Nate Carr part two. But Nate, <laughs> I, again, thank you so much, man. It's, it's always a pleasure to visit with you. Um, you guys I enjoy... have to call this show Mike and Mike. <laughs> we already have. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, we uh, we certainly enjoy getting the opportunity to talk with people like yourself and um, sharing wrestling stories, sharing insights for our coaches. I think it's such a big thing uh, that USA Wrestling continues to promote through our coaches council. Uh, this this broadcast because uh, without our coaches council, without Mike and, and the coaches education program, we wouldn't have opportunities like this. You know, uh, certainly technology has come its way over the years. And yes. uh, when we can bring people like yourself who have such value to the sport, to so many uh, individual coaches collectively across the country, this is a great opportunity. And, and I can't thank you enough, Nate. Well, I'd like to say to Mike and Mike, uh, continued success and God bless you in all your future endeavors. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nate. Thanks, Mike. Hey, and we'll be back for another edition of uh, Heads Up Podcast uh, in a couple of weeks. But until then, thanks for joining us today.